Now, the first fact that we need to establish is that when God created man, he created us for himself. That's the first point we must establish. When God created man, he created us for himself. So, uh, in, in short, we were created to be eternal companion for his son. So, the main player here is Jesus, not me and you. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's important to know, to acknowledge this day, but we need to know why he did it. And then what is your responsibility thereof? That's what we are trying to establish today. Otherwise, we would also say the seven saying, don't have a problem with them. I have not yet received a, a, a revelation why we should keep repeating them. That's, that's me. There's nothing wrong about the seven saying, by the way. They are just repeating what Jesus said. I can take you to the cross then. Let's, let's start from the cross then and repeat everything. There's nothing wrong, but we do it religiously. I, I, I'm being honest. I, I, I don't. I grew up in a church where we used to do it. I don't do it for now. I'm not saying it's wrong. Maybe one day God will give me a revelation. I'll do it. Hallelujah. So I would rather understand the significance of this day and understand my responsibility and then be able to appropriate what Jesus did in the cross. That's the best thing I can do. Hallelujah. Now, the first verse prove that we were created for Jesus. In this equation, um, <laughs> man doesn't feature per se. It is all about Jesus. Now, John 17, 24, this is what Jesus said. Father, I desire that they, they also whom you gave me may be with me when I, where I am that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now, Jesus is explaining now why we should be with him. He's saying the Father gave him us before we even created. Before the foundation of the world, of the earth, we belong to Jesus. Hallelujah. It's not because now he died for us. Now we belong to him. According to Jesus, before he created anything, and the reason why he created you, he created you as for himself. Please, humble me so that we... Hallelujah. Now, number two, we're still establishing that we, we've been created for Jesus. Philippians 3, 20 to 21. Once you know this, you won't be offended by many things. That many of us today are offended. Hallelujah. Many of us are offended. It's good to come read this day, but I'd rather appropriate everything that Jesus did for me and understand it. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eager wait for, this, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may conform to his glory. Now, the second thing you'll notice because it is about Jesus, not about you, God doesn't want to see you. You must conform to Jesus. You must look like him. That is why the mandate of the fivefold is in twofold. The first one is to unite everyone. The second one is to ensure that you conform to the image of Jesus. You see, it is not about you. When God looks at you, he wants to see who? Jesus. So, 
It is not about celebrating he died for us. It is good. But you have a responsibility to then conform to his likeness. Hallelujah. You see, the, the, the challenge is, this is a mistake that I think, whether it's in this generation we've, we've done, we've made this gospel about us. We put man at the center of this gospel. At the center of this gospel is Christ, not you. Hallelujah. You will notice when, when John the Baptist, when you start his preaching, he used to point people to the kingdom that is coming. And when the apostle and Jesus came, they, 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 they also emphasized on the kingdom issue, kingdom that is coming. The benefits were there, but were not primary things that we were focusing on. We, 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 we advertised the gospel using the benefit. We, we, God has called us to a kingdom where he rules, where he rules. Of course, you will benefit once you are in the kingdom, but you are not in the kingdom for the benefit per se. That is why when you read Matthew 11, verse 28, you'll understand this. This is what Jesus, this Jesus said. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But now, this is a promise. He's promising you to give you rest. Now take a look on 29. Would it take my yoke upon you and learn from me? So what Jesus is saying, in this kingdom, yokeless people are not needed. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus is saying, I can see you have a yoke, but in the kingdom, there's a way we deal with yokes. There must be an exchange. We, we have not come to draw our burden to Jesus and go back yokeless. And secondly, he's saying then, once there's an exchange that happens. The second step is, I will enroll you to a university of Jesus. He's saying, and learn from me. Once I, I give you my yoke, because the yoke of Jesus, he's saying it is light. But you cannot afford to, to room around yokeless. And complaining about the yokes upon your life. That's not what Jesus promised us. He said, come to me. You are heavy laden. I have a plan for you. I, have a, I, 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 I do have a yoke. But it is light. And once I give you my, my yoke which is light, I will then enroll you in the university of Jesus which is sometimes many of us, we don't like it. We have come to, to cast our yoke. When God says, come now, let me enroll you. Now, there's a standard you must learn from Jesus now. That's when the problem begins. Hallelujah. So today we're going to learn from him. Because part of this university is that you must learn from him. In other words, he came to demonstrate how to walk in this kingdom. There's nothing painful to walk with people who are yokeless. They become your burden. I know what I'm talking about. You have to carry them all the time. I have a yoke from God. And I have a man who is a burden to me. painful. Hallelujah. That's why in the kingdom 
We don't use people because of gifts. We check to have a yoke in you. If you are yokeless, we leave you with your gifts. Because along the way, you'll become a burden to us. The capacity I have is the yoke from above. Not to carry people. But nowadays, you are carrying them. They're yokeless. They are heavy little lad and they are crying out, God, take away our burden. When God says, come, let's exchange. Because even today, it was the day of exchange. Jesus did not just die for us. He died on our stead. And when he died, he said, I am going to give you my life. Bring yours. I normally say, when you are born again, you have given your life to God. That's not true. When you are born again, God, Jesus has given you his life. You have not yet surrendered when. There's a process of giving your life to Jesus. Consecration in the school of Jesus. That's where we're failing. Hallelujah. No, no, no. You, are, you have the eternal life if you are born again. You do have the life of Jesus. But I can assure you, you still have your life next to you. So today is a day of exchange. He died on our stead. We were meant to be punished. He was punished on our behalf so that we can exchange the less life. Exchange the burden. Exchange the yokes. It's not about Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You did everything. He did everything, but he expects you to give your life. Number three. Ephesians 5, 22. We are still establishing this fact that we were created for him. We ought to live for him. Now, obviously, yeah, Paul talks about wives and husband, but that's not where I want us to focus on. Wives, submit your own husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He is a savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husband in everything. I'm not going to talk about wives and uh, marriages, because the world has taught you wrong things, you'll be offended again. Yeah, there's a message from the world. Now, God says we need to be subjected to Christ. You know when you're a subject of something, your rights are taken away. Those who are from rural areas where they live under chiefs, they know what I'm talking about. There's a master. In other words, you subject yourself in everything. Let's leave the merit issue. I'm not here for that. But I think you got a hint. There's a head even in the marriage. There's a head who leads. We had a good session with men two weeks back. Laboring on these matters. The foundational matters. I said to people, don't ever address the issue of marriages unless you have a revelation of Christ and the church. If you don't have that elevation, you will take what the world is saying. They don't understand. You know why? Let's read um, 1 Corinthians verse 11. Oh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 8. Just, I just want to show you something using these similarities. There's something I want you to learn from this. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 8. For man is not from, the, from woman, but woman from man. Nor was a man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So now, Paul is explaining the reason why a woman must subject himself. But here I'm not talking about marriages. I'm talking about church. I'm talking about you. The reason why you need to subject yourself to Christ. 
Christ was not created for you. You were created for him. For that reason, you must subject yourself to him. Hallelujah. Even those who are married to always question this. Leave them. It needs revelation from above. It's saying this one was never created you for her. But she was created for you. It means the main character is who? You. Same with the church. Because the marriage is, is likened to the Christ and the church. But when you don't understand this, you will feel, why am I subjected? I can also think that the same attitude you'll have to Christ. That's what we do. God gave us a will. I have my desires. Why should I subject myself to this Christ? So the Bible says, remember, you were, not cre you were created for him. And let's look at the similarities. Let's look at the first Adam. God caused him to sleep. And he removed the woman. Same with the second Adam. Today, he was caused to sleep. In order to birth us. Hallelujah. The difference is that in the, in the first Adam, because sin, there was no sin at that time, I believe Adam did not feel any pain. God was in charge. He's the one who caused him to sleep. But this one, the second Adam, sin was involved. So punishment was involved. He birthed us through pain. And what I like, you know the wisdom of God. He said to Satan, you are the one who caused men to fall. And I'm going to use you to cause this Adam to sleep. You'll be involved in this equation. And I'll deal with you. God used Satan. He said, Satan, go find your people. Go find your Judas. Find your Pilate. All these people. I am going to use you to cause this one to sleep. Hallelujah. The wisdom of God. You know, there are times it might look you are being defeated. You don't understand the wisdom of God. Satan... God can use Satan. He is a fool. Without a full stop, yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. He can use him. In our city, all things, whether good and bad, you don't like the bad part. And those bad things, God changed them to your advantage. It looked like Satan is winning. It looked like he's killing him. He's, he's, he's done with Jesus. Lately, did he know he's been used? Because we needed a Judah. That's why in your life, don't, 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 he washed their feet. He washed his feet knowing this is Judah. He fed him knowing this is Judah. But you need that Judah. If it was me, you would have dealt with that Judah. Harshly. Isolate him. Then his part. He's, he's important in this equation. For the fulfillment of the purpose of God. There are times we are going through, we don't, we don't understand. Stop blaming God. Stop taking offense. You need those bad things. Bangisha, all we are told, come to Jesus. Everything will be well. It is true, but there's a process. It is in that process that God will enroll you to learn from him. Now we are learning from him. 
Hallelujah. Now, let's get to, the, to our main um, message. We need to understand the condition of this covenant we're in. Yeah, we're in a covenant. Let's read 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20. Because God understands the covenant. In a covenant, there's always two parties. And they both have responsibilities. And uh, both parties ought to study the covenant and understand the covenant. And deliver as per the covenant. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2, oh, let me start from 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, in your spirit. Which are God. Now, before we even begin the journey, let's understand the content of this journey we're in. You are not your own. Somebody purchased you. Now, when you own something, you have a right to use that thing without asking it, generally. I would imagine you have a car, you want to go to the shop, you are trying to, to start the car, it says, no, I'm not going anywhere. What kind of car is that? We have such people in the kingdom today. They want to use God. They think they own Jesus. They want to dictate terms to Jesus. And when things don't go according to what they want, they are offended at him. These days when I was just celebrating, ooh, see a pass again, religiously. It defeats the purpose if you don't know why you are here. We are here to be reminded that Jesus, when he died, he purchased you. He owns you. You are his possession. Hallelujah. There's a monster that we've created ourselves. It's a monster. And it's difficult to sustain it. Hallelujah. They are hungry, these people. But they're not hungry for Jesus. They are hungry for the hands of Jesus. And they are easily offended. When things don't go their way, they stop coming to church. When things don't go their way, they stop worshipping this Jesus. Because in their mind, they've come to own this Jesus. You were bought so that you'll be a subject in the hands of a king. You were brought not into a church per se, into a kingdom where there's king, where there are princip principles, there are rules. Grace. It is not a tool to use God. But grace is a, is a tool that God used to empower us. When you talk about grace, you're talking about empowerment. You are empowered not to sin. You are empowered to, to overcome Satan. That's what grace means. Nothing else. Titus 2 verse 14 who gave himself for, for us to redeem us from all lowliness and purify for himself a people. So what Jesus is doing in the cross, yes, he's doing it for you, but he's purifying for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So what happened in the cross? Jesus was purifying a people for himself. 
He did not purify you for yourself. To then take what he did and throw it back at him. But all what he was doing in the cross was for First Corinthians 7, 22. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. So, now, Jesus called us to enslave us. In short, While we are commemorating this day today, we are officially being enslaved by him. You know, a slave is someone who do not have rights. A slave is someone who takes instruction. Sometimes the desires of the slave are not considered. That's why Paul used to say, I am a born servant. Means a slave, a prisoner of Christ. So he freed us from sin to enslave us. In other words, we were enslaved by, we were enslaved by the enemy. So he said, no, 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 no. Let me free them so that I can enslave them. I am a better master. I know how to reward a slave. I know how to look after a slave. And that's where the problem is. People want to have their desires. They want to be, they want to live free. Of course we are free, but there are boundaries because we have a master. Hallelujah. Let's read Revelation 4 verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So, it's not like God is not God if you don't worship him. Remember, man has been in existence for only 6,000 years. Forget about evolution. That's a gospel from the pit of hell. Hallelujah. So God was God before us. Now he's saying, I created you for my own pleasure. Not your pleasure. That is why after he created everything, he said, it is good. Because he was pleased with what he created. So we live for his own pleasure. I normally say, don't take life serious. Don't be serious too much. You were just created for his pleasure. And now... Because he created you for his pleasure, it means he must be pleased. Not you. There are times where he will share the pleasure with you, but in most of the times, he must always be pleased. That is why there are times when you are not pleased and you complain. And you say, where is God? I'm not pleased. Why can't you say like Jesus? Jesus understood this. When it was tough, when he was approaching the cross, when his desires, when everything came, he said, I am here for my father. I'm no longer pleased with this journey. It's tough. But because it's not about me, he said, let your will be done. That's the learning we need to learn from Jesus. That's the school that we're enrolling you in. There are times you won't be pleased. And what you do when you're not pleased? You take offense. You're offended with God. You're offended with the men of God. 
you're offended with the church, you're offended with everybody, it's because you have not yet been enrolled to the school of Jesus. You've just came to cast your burden. There's a school you need to enter and you must learn from him. So we're learning from him now. And what is interesting, Jesus told his disciple before he even went to the cross, he introduced the cross. It was before he went to the cross. He said, if you want to follow me, take your cross. He was enrolling them to the school that he's in himself. You think it's about Jesus going to the cross. You have your own cross as well to take and follow him. But his feet, is, it's, it is created. God understands your capacity. And you are rejecting it. All you are saying, God, I have burden. Take it away. God says, the way I take away burden. Let's do an exchange, my son. Let's do an exchange. Would you allow me to enroll you into the University of Jesus? Where we are promised higher position. We are promised great things. You would think, because God has promised it, immediately you will get into it. Jesus lived for 30 years under close heaven. I would imagine when the Holy Spirit came, baptized him, or John the Baptist came, baptized him. I don't know, but it's Jesus. He, he, has, he, he could discern. He knew. You would think now the ministry begins. Now, the school continues that grades. Now, the same Holy Spirit that gives you power is the same Holy Spirit that leads people to a, a wilderness. The one that baptized men with fire, he is the one that lead men to the wilderness to train them. Now, the difference with Jesus, before I am a wilderness, he was given an instruction to fast and pray and prepare. You are not prepared. We are calling a fasting for a man. You are nowhere to be found. You don't know why it has been called. God knew in, there's something in April coming, in May coming. And in this civilization, God don't fight. You were told, oh, he fight for us. No, you fight. That is why he said, while they were sleeping, the enemy came and sought us. Who was sleeping, God? Who was sleeping? God told him, is it Paul in the book of Ephesians? Would you be strong in the Lord? You put the armor of God. God is not fighting Satan. You are fighting Satan. Be armed. Don't enter the battle, the battle ground naked. It's dangerous. What do we do? We are under grace. We understand God will fight for us. God, God gives you the abilities to fight the devil. In the cross, he showed you how to fight the enemy. He's saying, take my victory. Maintain it. And what do you do? You are sleeping. You are walking. I'm, I'm, I'm looking up to you, God. Is this how you're going to appropriate what happened in the cross? God will fight for my battle. How does he fight for your battle? He arms you. He says, go, my son. Don't sleep. When you sleep, that's why he said, watch and pray. That's your responsibility. Not God's responsibility. Oh, we're under grace. You hardly pray. He fights for me. Check your life. Isn't it David? He said, God, teach my hands to fight. Teach my fingers. God will fight for me. Let's wait and see. But I've given you everything pertaining to life. 
It's yours to appropriate it and use it. But because of ignorance, people are dying like ants. I don't know how did I get it. I saw the message. Colossians 1 verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Now, when he, when he died, he delivered you. But you can go back at your own. He conveyed us into a kingdom of sun. Kingdom of sun ministry. He converted us to a kingdom of sons. Of his love. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sin. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. And that are in heaven and that are on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones, dominions, or principalities and, or powers. All things were created through him and for him. All things were created through him and for him. We are still not in the equation there. In terms of ownership. And he is before all things. And in, in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body. The church. Who is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. That in all things he may have preeminence. How is long? He created us for himself so that in all things he may have what? Preeminence. In our to be first or to rank first or to, to, to be superior to all others. Hallelujah. So, Jesus must take preeminence in our life. Not us. If we're truly appropriating what Jesus did, and Jesus now is saying, I should be number one in all things. When you dream, dream about me. When you think, think about me. If there's any purpose that you're busy with, let it be about me. Anything you do, it should be about me. It's not about you. You've made it about you. Check your prayer request. It's about you. So that you, you'll be happy. You want pleasure. You want, you want to share pleasure with God. Not that God doesn't care about your needs. He's just saying, let me mean, I want to be number one. And you will see what I will do. That is why he's saying, seek me first. Seek my kingdom first. Forget about the other things. I will give it to you. Because before I created you, I knew you. And I have a plan to prosper you. I am not fighting prosperity here. But there's a way we prosper in this kingdom. Hallelujah. Sometimes we abuse one principle of giving money. Think and buy God. It is a principle to receive money as well. But that's not the only principle according to God. He's saying if you prioritize me, Prioritize my agenda. I will prioritize you. Hallelujah. 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all things, in him all the fullness should dwell. So, this strategy 
I'm introducing to you, please the Father. That you should be subjected to Jesus. It pleased the Father. And I believe we are here to please him. Let's read Romans 14, verse 7. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. Continue. Until verse 9. Verse 8. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Hold on here. This is Paul. He's saying, Paul understood that he's, he's owned by God. He's saying, if I live, I live for him. Even if I die, I die for him. That's a strong statement. So, Paul is saying, it doesn't matter how I die. If it please God that I die this way, let it be. If it pleases you, God, that my situation is like this. I'm not talking to, to ignorant people who have not taken responsibility. I'm telling someone who appropriated everything, took responsibility, but the situation remained the same. If it pleases you that this situation glorifies you, God, let it be. I'm putting a disclaimer again. I'm not talking to people who are ignorant, who have not done their part. Then they say, if Some other things we are going through is because of our ignorance. It's not the will of God. We can't use this to justify our ignorance and our lack of knowledge. I'm talking to people who knows their story. I've done everything, God, but the situation remains the same. Let it be, O oh God, if it glorifies you. Don't die like a fool because of your ignorant and say, if it is your will, God. That is why if you want to hear lies, go to funerals. Even pastor's lies. A four, year, four years old dies, it was your will, O oh God. A will of God for his voice to die. A 16 year old to die. It's a will of God. The Bible says Satan has come to kill, destroy, and steal. You can't be ignorant and then attribute everything to God. It is your will, God. No, do your part, know your responsibility. And when a situation remains, you've prayed, you've fasted, you've read the well, you've used all the principle. And the situation still remains the same. Glory to you, God. If, my, if this pleases you, O oh God, glory to you, O oh God. If I die, check how the apostle, all of them died. God never rescued them. It was the will of God for them to be killed the way they were killed. They were hanged on the cross, most of them. God could have saved them. He saved John, the apostle, because he wanted him first to reveal the book of Revelation. He's the only one who was never killed. They tried to put him on the boiling oil. He came out alive. Because God can save you in any situation. If it pleases him. But when it comes to Paul, he allowed him. When it comes to Peter, he allowed him. When it comes to Stephen, he should have done something. Instead, Stephen, he saw heaven open. If you know who owns you, you will never complain sometimes. The reason why you are offended and you complain a lot you don't know who owns you. Sometimes we think God owns, owes us something. That's harsh. He's God. He 
He owns us. Hallelujah. When you read, is it Revelation chapter 12? Verse 11. Please read for me. Revelation 12, verse 11, New King James Version. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Ah, the blood of Jesus, true. Oh, testimony. No, no, no. It's not the two only. It was the blood and testimony. And thirdly, they did not love their life to death. When the, when the word of God says in the last days there will be a generation that loves themselves. They love themselves so much. It's about them. But this one, this is how they conquered Satan. They did not love. That is why Jesus, he made sure before you follow him, he will look at you. Are you ready? Are you sure? Do you love your life? Do you love your mom? Do you love your child? Do you love your father? If you do, do you love money? You do. These are the things that will destroy you with. Rather, don't walk with me. Because you've got something that the enemy may come. And eventually he came to Judas. He loved money. And the requirement to follow him was to not love anything. But to Prioritize Jesus. But there was a man found in the company, in the school of Jesus. He loved money. He adored money. Money was everything. Something about said, I found someone to use. That's how Judah was destroyed. He had things in his heart that he prioritized. Satan checked. What's in your heart? That's why God, he made sure, he said, don't lay treasures on earth. Lay them where? In heaven. Why? Where your treasures is, your heart is. So now there's a competition to enter on your heart. Money is not just the paper you have. It's a spirit. It can enthrone itself in your heart. And when, you, when money enthrones itself in your heart, it becomes mammon. Your heart is far from God. We're in the school of Jesus today. It's hard. There's a cross to carry. There's a price to carry, to, to pay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Colossians 1 verse 10. So that you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respect. Hallelujah. It's not just a grace issue. To work, walk worthy and to please who? In all respect. And let me tell you, there are times when you are pleasing God, you won't be pleased. Because it's not about you. There are times when we have to please God, you won't be pleased. But because we've introduced this seeker-friendly gospel, that is about receiving, getting, getting, you have not yet been enrolled to the school of Jesus, but you want the things of Jesus. Satan will enthrone himself to you. You are a danger. Jesus, that's why they, she didn't want such people. But there's one who sneak in. Judas. We need to please who? Jesus. We are still not in the equation. So the Lord, Christ. That is why you are called Christian. You are called Christ-like. It's not about you. It's about Christ. He must be pleased. Church now is tend to be a place where people 
are entertained and are pleased. Such people are troublesome, are troublemakers. You can't bank on them. When the going gets tougher, they will turn against you. They are yokeless. They are looking a savior to take away a burden so that they can be free to do what they want, what it pleases them. Tell your neighbor, this is the school of Jesus. You've been enrolled to the university of Jesus. What you learn from me, that's what Jesus says. Learn from me. We are learning from him today. John 6. Please read from 22 to 27. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into the boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. From a distance, when you observe these people, you would think that they're looking, they're seeking Jesus. Of course, they are running after, they are not, they are running after him and they have an agenda. They went to a particular place, they didn't find him. Then they kept seeking. They are with us. You, you think we're all seeking for Jesus. And eventually they found him. And this is how Jesus replied to them. Jesus, or they said, and when they found him on the other side, they said to him, Rabbi, where did you come? When did you come here? They are looking for a blesser. In other words, where we find our blesser? Jesus looked at them. And he answered and said, Most I most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me. Yes, you do seek. Yes, you do pray. Yes, you do fast. But check your prayer request. How many of us knows why, why you are here on earth? If I may ask you, what is your purpose from above? Do you care? Does it matter? As long as I've, I'm, I'm a child and live. Not because you saw the sign, but because you ate of the loaf and were filled. Now you think I'm your blesser. That will keep feeding you. There's a way I feed my people. Not the way you want to. You are seeking me not because of me. You are seeking me because of my hands. You are coming because you saw, a, you saw something. But enthroned in your heart, this mammon is not Jesus. You don't want Jesus. You have issues. You just want someone to resolve these issues and go back to your life, your normal life. You have no interest in this Jesus. Jesus said, and if you study Jesus, Jesus did not have time for a crowd. We like crowd because it applauds us. Jesus had no time for a crowd. He used to run away from them. And when we meet them, our shang, our parables confuse them. They 
are not looking for me anyway. You can't give treasures to swines. That's what Jesus was saying. That's the word. I'm not insulting people. That's the word. Hide the treasures. This is for sons, not for swines. Hallelujah. Don't take offense. Sons don't take offense. When God disciplines them, they don't take offense. But unbelievers take offense. You are not looking for me. It is not about me. It is about you and your stomach. I know you. You act like you are looking for me. You act like you have come to commemorate me. You are hungry and looking for something for your stomach, you. Never a time Jesus spoke. Jesus was harsh. There was a, you see, this crowd, a crowd is dangerous. The very same people will crucify you. Do you know the people who crucified Jesus? Some of them ate the bread. They were there. Look for disciples. Be surrounded by disciples. Even if there are few, I would rather have 12 than to have 1,000 that is headed to hell. Jesus had the smallest church ever. When he started, it was big. There was chaff in there. You think when it's great, it's success. That's how we measure success. Jesus looked at the heart. He had no time for the crowd. He had no time for the crowd. Crowd. They will say, persecute him. When things are not well with you, even if you're a leader, they are the first to persecute you. We knew he's fake, man. Long back, we knew he's fake. I'm not surprised. We knew there was something in me that says he's fake. Now, now, no, look, he is. Because crowd, they, they don't know the way to palace is wilderness. When you prophesy to a crowd, they think what you've told them tomorrow will just happen. The fact that there's a prophecy, that's why sometimes you don't prophesy a crowd. They don't even know how to handle it. As soon as God promised you something, I said to you, the first place is not palace, it's wilderness. When God took the Israelites from Egypt, they never went straight to Canaan. The first place was wilderness. Do you know there was a shortcut? No, there, there was. God, God could have used a shortcut from Egypt to Canaan. But the concerns, he said, they don't know me. Secondly, they don't know how to fight. If I take them full of vision, so, they will forget about me when they get to Canaan. And when they get to Canaan, they will meet giant. They might not know to fight. Let me enroll them to the school of wilderness. Remove everything and see if they will trust me. That's how God trains a man. He promises you when you think you have arrived. It's a wilderness. It's a wilderness. I said that the difference between me and you, when Jesus faced the enemy, he was prepared. He had fasted 40 days, 40 nights. He knew the way. You, when you when you face the enemy, you have not prayed, you have not fasted, you don't know the word, you are easily deceived and defeated. And when it's getting tough, you go back to God. Where are you, God? I need a covering. What's wrong with the covering? Salvation is personal. Hallelujah. Jesus Adam and Eve, they were unprepared when faced Satan. 
Jesus came to school us. This is how you face the enemy. You must have prayed. Because enemy will test your heart. And how did he tempt Jesus? He checked at him, looked at him. Oh, he's hungry, this one. He's hungry. Let me use the hunger to tempt him. Tend this. Jesus said, oh, there's something more important than this bread. Everything that comes out from the Father. A man cannot live by bread alone. There's another bread which we despised. When we say, let's come and do, if you, if you can say there's a Bible school or um, not Bible school per se, a, a study of some sort, come and we'll study and pray. See how many people will come. Put that today, there will be deliverance, prophecies. Nothing wrong about those things. Check the crowd will come. They have no business with Jesus. They have no business with God. All they are looking for to feed their stomach who is their master. This is their master. They are doing everything. They can work from 4 a.m. till 1 p or 1 a.m. the following morning. They say they are hustling. When God blesses you, the blessings of the Lord add no sorrow. There's no toiling. When God blesses you, let me repeat, there is no toiling. Check how you're toiling. Are you getting the blessing using the correct doors or you're trying to manipulate? Sorrow will be upon you and toiling will be a sign upon you. Always tired. Don't have time. If you prioritize Jesus, he'll promote you. He'll prioritize you. That's the gospel. The gospel says repent. At that time, they said the kingdom of God is at hand. But now the kingdom of God is already here. Hallelujah. Now we're praying. Last verse. The enemy of the cross leaves Satan aside. It's self-ambition. Leave Satan and demons aside. They are already defeated. The enemy, number one, is self. Self then produces ambition, selfless, selfishness. Those are product of self. Now, let's learn we're going to read two verses now we're praying. Um, Philippians 2. We start from verse 2 to verse, verse 3. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. I want to leave it there. And then jump to verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. What was this mind? Who being in the form of God did not concede the robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He made himself of no reputation. Tina, whatever we are doing, we are seeking reputation. Recognition. We want fame. Taking the form of a born servant and coming in on all in the likeness of men. Now, this is how in the kingdom he exalted. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to the point of what? Death. 
What you call death in the kingdom, that's the way how we rise. In the kingdom, the only way to rise is to die. It might look like it is finished about Jesus. Little did he know that when he killed him, he is planting him. For a seed to grow, it needs to be planted. And once it's planted, it dies. Don't be confused by your situation that looks dead. It could be today it's your first day in the ground. Don't be confused by your circumstances. It look hard. It look like it's dead. You've prayed, you've done everything. It could be today is your second day underneath. Stay in there. Don't disturb it. If you, if you dig and remove the plant, now we are, now we are, we are really killing it. Let it die here. That's how in the kingdom we get exalted. The third day is coming. Because it is in the third day that things are resurrected. It is in the third day that your name will be exalted. Don't complain. Don't take offense by your first day. It might look in the cross the Father has left you. That's how in the kingdom we rise. There are times, even in my life, I would say, is God still here? Don't ever ask that question. It's an ignorant question. He's there. Anything that grows, it must die. Sometimes it might look like God has forsaken you. will never leave you nor forsake you. We are just being enrolled in the school of Jesus. This is how we rise in the kingdom. God himself will bruise you. He will take that ego. God knows how to take your ego. Some of it is because of your qualification. Or the business you own. Or your background. Pride, God will bruise you. When He wants to promote you, He knows how to bruise you. And He's Dara. Umanga to stubborn, He leaves you. Remember, they were meant to be in the wilderness for how many days? Ten. But they were stubborn. He left them there. Just reconcile 43 years or 40 years to 10 days. It doesn't make sense. When you are stubborn in the school of Jesus, he leaves you. So he has not learned. He's God of mercy. But in the kingdom, it's not about grace every day. It is true that grace is unmerited. The grace that is unmerited is the grace to receive salvation only. Any other graces they are merited. In the kingdom, God gives you a leak and look at your attitude. Your, your attitude toward the leak promotes you. How you use the leak, you labor for other things. We want power, power, we want to raise the dead. With the anointing you have, what have you done? God He's not wasteful. He doesn't just add. He checks. I gave you this anointing. What have you done? How many hospitals have you visited? How many prisons have you visited? How many have you led to Christ? But you want to raise the dead. We are joking. There's a responsibility in this kingdom. We mature to sonship. And as we mature, God open realms. There are dimensions you are busy praying for you want. God looks at you. You are failing in that dimension I've placed you. You're busy calling grace. It is by the grace. 
When you see a, a, an, an anointed man, it's not just grace. They've paid the price. I want to be prophet card to do what he does. Do you know the price he paid and the price he's paying right now? It's not about just impart impartation. Impartation just initializes you. But there are realms where you walk on your own. Got to be disciplined. You got to labor. If the only time you pray when the church declare fasting, then you're not ready. On your own, have you ever taken 21 days of fasting without praying for job? The only time you pray is because you're in trouble and it's too late. We pray before troubles. Because when we're in troubles, troubles has also a voice. If you don't know the voice of God before a trouble, you don't think you'll hear God in the storm. Storm speaks louder. You will take instruction from the storm and be offended. You need to know the voice of God while it is nice, quiet. So that when you are in trouble, he will give you instruction because a storm speaks. You can make a decision because of the storm, not because of the Holy Spirit. This day is about Christ and Him alone. Him being exalted. If you want your parent to be taken away, learn from Him. We've been deceived. I believe in prosperity. I preach prosperity in my church. But there's a way I preach it very responsible. If the first message you heard when you come to church is, is prosperity, you've been introduced to Mammon. You will think it's about receiving things. First message is about Christ. Consecration. Dying and rise. But that's for sons only. Can you stand up and pray? What a day it is. What a day. But we thank God for reminding us. God wants to bless you. I have not come here to mock your situation that you are going through. God cares his love. But I can lie to you and promise you it's, this is your year. Hallelujah. I want us to go to God. First thank him for what he did on the cross. And I want us to pray a prayer of surrender. And it's a process. It's not a one-day thing. Take your cross daily. 